Welcome everyone to our first webinar. Um, for those who haven't worked with Nolte Bespoke before, um, it's worthwhile highlighting that one of our key strengths in what we do is our constant desire to explore, test and play with materials. With our free time and whenever we can, we'll always be talking to our artists and suppliers to either explore new materials, maybe even a combination of materials, um, and to learn about new techniques available to us. And because of that, it means that we're probably quite experienced and knowledgeable in the field of these things. Um, and a lot of the times we do these experiments even before we need them for a particular project. So what we thought we would do is we put together a series of webinars for you, especially during these times. The first one will be on glass. In the next four weeks, we will do one on ceramic and one on acrylic. Now looking at the craft of glass blowing, it's a very, very old craft. It's been around for years. And one of the most amazing things about it is very much how it still remains the same, using the same tools, um, same techniques, the processes um, from, you know, your rods to your furnace and to even the newspaper and, you know, the bucket of water. Um, and you'd find that, you know, it's, it's a very delicate technique almost. You have artists working with furnaces that get to ridiculous temperatures and also working with a um, working with a form that changes completely once once you know once in heat so you very much have a material that is a solid to start off with and then once it's been um once it's at that melting point it's a completely different texture it's a completely different form um, a lot more flexible a lot more bendy and fluid um, and that definitely requires an element of skill um, and as we have worked with various different artists, I think for us, one of the things that we came across was the fact that you have certain glass blowers who are really good at one particular technique or one particular process, and maybe not so good at the other. Um, and a lot of the times it isn't that they can't actually physically do or explore these other techniques. It's more just the fact that they don't really want to. So it's, it's a tech, it's, it's a craft that involves a lot of passion. Um, and they obviously find their way and find, you know, the one technique or the one process that they that they very much enjoy doing. So for us, it's very much all about, you know, the beauty of glass and light, obviously. Um, cause, you know, as, as lighting designers. And what this webinar essentially will consist is various different techniques that we've come across along the time and along the years and also experimenting and designing for particular projects and how these techniques um, react with light, what do they provide us um, and sort of just touching upon um, you know, the beauty within within each one. So the first technique that we wanna go through um, is called Fritz. And actually we came across this technique when we were designing Perla for Fenton Whelan probably about three years ago. So you can see an image there on your screen of the installation that we did. Now, Perla is very much based on an oyster shell. So the client almost wanted to have sort of oyster shells webbed out on his ceiling. And for us, when we were designing this, we already knew that we wanted it to be in glass, but the challenge was how were we going to capture the rough texture that you find on an oyster shell and translate that onto you know, your glass form. And we really wanted to focus on sort of the pattern and the texture that you find on an oyster shell and you know, incorporating a little bit of color into this. Now, the way that Fritz works in this case, you have three different colored glass so you'd obviously start off with your colored rod and you'd sort of just chip at it until you have all these tiny little particles and crushed um, glass and you'd sort of lay it out on a flat surface now if you want to be quite smart you can sort of lay it out in the way that you're manipulating the gradients of color but what happens is you get a um, translucent base on a rod at melting point when it's raw red and you would sort of roll it across your frets now your raw red sort of hot melting translucent glass is going to pick up 
all of these um, particles, all of this crushed glass, and it's now embedded in its form. The reason why this works quite well is because your translucent glass has a different melting point to your colored glass. So although your translucent glass is very much at melting point, it's raw red, it's hot, your colored glass isn't going to melt as quickly. So it's embedded in this form, it's being stretched and pulled, um, but because it's not melting as quickly into the translucent glass, it's leaving sort of quite a thick layer of that texture that you'll be able to, to feel once, um, once the process is over. Now, the reason why this technique is one of our favorites, it not only allows you to sort of um, focus on color and texture, you can create a pattern, you can create gradients, but also once in contact with light, it has a beautiful projection, a beautiful washes of patterns that you can get on the nearby flat surfaces. Um, and with that, you're able to create sort of these wonderful moods and bring drama into a space with this colorway that we did for um, the Stuff and Tall God showroom. It's very, you know, it's very calming and smoothing. It almost feels like you have fractions of your ocean in that space. The next one that we're going to touch upon is called the cracked ice effect. Now, we came across this technique when we were designing a traditional chandelier for Studio Duggan. So when we were focusing on this design, we really wanted to create a glass component that was going to almost glister and shine the way that, you know, a heavily faceted glass component or a crystal would in a traditional chandelier. But what we didn't want was the heaviness that sometimes comes with faceted components um, like crystals. Um, and with this particular design, we really had this, this idea of sort of quite a feminine um, kind of sort of natural petal shape um, for, for this particular chandelier. Um, but we needed it to sort of have a texture that would really help. Um, light to to reflect. So we came across this technique. So the way that the cracked ice effect work is you would essentially need to create your form. So you'd again have your translucent glass at melting point and you'd create your form that you desire and once you have that you would dip it in a bucket of water and because of the temperature change due to the thermal shock it's going to shatter the glass and create all of these really delicate lines on the surface. But just as quickly as you do that, you then also dip it back into the furnace and allow all these components to sort of be strong again um, and 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 uh, and sort of glue. And what you then have is almost sort of you know the the effects of the the thermal shock. Um, these very fine, delicate lines, all these cracks, um, but you have a strong, solid piece of glass that you can then use in your composition. We've obviously wanted to sort of layer it up um, in um, a very traditional mannerism. The reason why this is incredibly beautiful is, as you can see in that image over there on, uh, so what, the fourth image, on third image on the right-hand side of your screen, um, is once it comes in contact with light, it pretty much has a very glistering, um, sparkly effect, just as you know your traditional um, crystal would. The next one that I want to touch upon is called the bicarbonate soda effect, and it's actually be one of my favorites because it's one of the easiest and simplest um, techniques um, to to do. And um, as the name evolves i mean it, it it very much is using sort of chemicals to create um to create a, an effect but we can see we were looking at this um at this technique a while back it, it didn't go ahead but it was for a client who, who was looking at sort of globes um, and these globes were actually going to go in a meeting room, but you know, it's, 
it, with most people, when we're looking at globes, that a lot of our clients will ask us, how can they make them interesting? Because they don't just want sort of a simple standard globe. And we'll look at techniques. Sometimes we'll look at adding color. Um, but it's interesting because the discussion will always be, you know, what space are these are these going into? Because like meeting rooms, you don't really want to have colored globes if they're going to give people, you know, orange faces. Same thing with you know, you don't really want to add techniques um, and textures to the glass if it's going to project patterns onto a meeting table, etc. But the way that this particular technique works. Um, it's very simple to be fair. So you'd have your your hot melting translucent glass um, and you'd throw in a little bit of the bicarbonate soda. And because of the chemical reaction that um, happens with the heat of the melting glass and obviously the chemical, it creates all these tiny little bubbles um, within the glass, but then these bubbles get trapped. And because they get trapped once, you remove your um, glass element and it's now cooled down, you're able to get all these tiny little bubbles, almost like, you know, a, an explosion of galaxy in your glass texture. And they work amazingly well. They do, however, allow for a lot of projection to happen depending on how you're going to use this in a lighting installation. You can kind of see a little bit of it on the second picture on the right hand side of your screen where it's sort of an explosion of, um, of tiny little bubbles and um, that can be wonderful in certain spaces but then for example in this case meeting rooms not so much. But then it brings us on to the next discussion, which is actually talking about how you would use the right material and the right technique and the right illumination. So, for example, with the GLOBE project that we were asked to look into for this meeting room, you know, you have a client who actually wants to make these globes very interesting, quite organic, different colors, different textures, but ultimately they need to be functional. They're the only light source in this room. And, you know, this room is going to be used for meetings and therefore there are going to be loads of people sitting around this table. Um, so when we look at sort of using the right material and the right techniques and, and, and how that's going to have an impact on the light effect. Um, in this situation, what you could do, for example, is you would only add color on the first half of your globe. Um, so sort of the top part of your globe and you would drop your light source further down within your globe which hopefully what that means is that then the beam angle of your light source isn't going to reach the the more colored and the more textured part of your globe and therefore there'll be less color and less projection obviously for it not to look you know, weird that you only have sort of um, a lot of color on one half and not so much, you can create sort of a nice gradient. So you have a really dark tones of amber, for example, and then they sort of eventually fade out until there's only have a slightest tint. And that's an interesting way to work with things um, because, you know, there is an element of creating sort of bespoke, unique features, whether they're residential, whether they're hospitality to commercial and working in office spaces. Um, but still thinking very much about the light output and how you're going to incorporate these materials. Um, obviously, the two um, projects that I showed, the one with Perler and the one with the cracked ice effect, these are residential properties and they're very much looking for uh, an atmosphere. Um, with Perla, they wanted to in have the, you know, the injection of color and injection of texture so that it really did look like you had oyster shells, um, you know, floating on in your ceiling. And, and with that, the light um, was, was probably one of uh, the, the last things that we looked at because they were just decorative only um, and had all sorts of architectural lighting within the space to support the illumination of the room. With obviously your Studio Duggan, um, you're looking at a traditional chandelier and you want your pieces to glister. You want them to, to, to sparkle like you would, you know, you have crystals. Um, but then at that point, you do also need to think about the light source um, and the, the technique 
um, because it's all great using glass, but if you're going to use a flat sheet of glass, it's not going to do much with, with light. Um, and then obviously with the globes, it is a combination of everything, you know, the right material, manipulating the right technique so that you are achieving sort of an interesting um, globe, but still very much functional and not um, distracting the space and its functionality, which in this case is a meeting room. Um, so I think that very much touches upon um, all of those three techniques. Um, I do have a video that I'm going to play, which kind of resumes everything that we've discussed and, and, and um, visually will probably make a little bit more sense. So I'll run that through for you guys now. And obviously, if you have any questions, please feel free to um, go into this chat area and type away. Thank you so much for um, your time. Uh, we will be back in two weeks time with the uh, ceramic webinar. Thank you.